we've got three more presentations, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go straight to the presentations without too much of an introduction. And if the presenters could please um, keep this down to less than 10 minutes if they can, so that we can, um, so I'm told we need to be out of here by six. Um, so um, if uh, Emma Rice, um, who's going to be presenting on screen via internet, Hi, thank you very much. And thank you so much to everybody for oh. bearing with us over these two very, very <laughs> long thank days. You. Yes, indeed. <laughs> if, you um, could go ahead, if you could go ahead straight away. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, just, I just wanted to mention there's been a, a question for Jane uh, from in, in, in the chat, which I thought was really interesting. If the warp and weft of your lecture was translated into a museum, what would it be called? So I'm not going to attempt to answer that. Okay, so I do have a paper on objects in Northern Irish collections associated with the Chinese maritime customs, but it's been a very, very long day. And I think that uh, we'll really just try and, uh, and race through a few key points that I'd like to, to highlight. Uh, so what was the Chinese maritime customs and why are the collections associated with it, or so many collections associated with it, held in Northern Ireland? Uh, well, as many here will know, Robert Hart, a Queen's graduate from Portadown, who previously worked as a British consular official in China, was appointed as Inspector General of the Chinese Imperial Maritime Customs in 1863, when he was 28. The maritime customs had been established uh, five years earlier during the Second Opium War as part of the unequal treaties imposed on China, which mandated that a foreign-led service should levy customs duties on foreign trade across all of China's maritime ports. So the Chinese maritime customs was for Britain a kind of halfway house to empire, allowing Britain to exercise enormous influence over Chinese governance and international trade. But it was also a kind of imperium in imperio with a substantial degree of autonomy from both the Chinese and British governments. And this fiefdom was at least in part a Hart family enterprise with the Hart clan becoming what Hans van der Ven has called a Northern Irish customs service aristocracy. Oops. Hart himself, along with the relatives and numerous acquaintances whom he recruited into the Chinese maritime customs, were responsible for significant collecting, and some of these collections found their way back to Ireland. So you can see there that members of the Hart family were in charge of the Chinese maritime customs for about two thirds of the entire history of this organization. So very, very close association between the Chinese imperial maritime customs and Northern Ireland. Um, I won't say too much about the different objects that I was going to draw uh, attention to today. Just to mention that there are uh, some interesting items in the Ulster Museum. But what I think I'll, I'll come to and maybe dwell on is a collection that people might not know about uh, that we have in Queen's University Belfast. So Hart was an energetic collector of photography, and that's re resulted in Queens having an outstanding collection of the photography of China. The bulk of that collection consists of work by Western photographers, but today I'd like to focus on two Asian artists whose work is included in the Hart collection. Firstly, an example of how an extraordinary collection of Chinese art can also illuminate aspects of British imperialism. Lai Arfong, who was uh, born round about 1839 and who died in 1890, was a commercial photographer in Hong Kong. Um, he's now considered to be the greatest Chinese photographer of the 19th century. Uh, we've so far identified 201 Lai Arfong photographic prints in the Queen's collection making that a really significant publicly accessible collection of the, the, of the work of this photographer, Lai Arfong. 
historians might also be interested in what is missing from the Queen's holding, holdings of Lai Afong pieces. So Afong worked across a range of different genres, from street scenes and landscapes to documentary photography. But he's also well known for studio photography of so-called types, uh, models used to illustrate purported aspects of Chinese society, such as opium smoking or life as a laborer. Queens doesn't hold any of that kind of material from Afong or from any other photographer working in China, whether Chinese or European. And that's because Robert Hart never collected that kind of material. But he did collect more images by Lai Afong than by any other professional photographer in Robert Hart's collection. So what does that tell us? Well, it suggests perhaps that Afong's beginnings photographing the expansion of colonial Hong Kong and his work traveling around China perhaps meant that Hart found Afong's perspective more engaging than that of peregrinatory Western photographers like Felice Beato or John Thompson. Hart seems to have had no interest in photographic tourist stereotypes about a country he had lived in since the age of 19. Hart was often viewed with suspicion by the British press who considered him to have become too Chinese in his long years away from the UK. Now Hart's Chinese critics saw that very differently and saw him with good grounds as an agent of British imperialism. But certainly in his photographic preferences, Hart differed from when many of his Western contemporaries. One final point about the photography collection and then I'll finish. I won't say much about this, I've written about it elsewhere. Um, but perhaps the most historically important photograph in the Queen's collection is this one, credited to an otherwise unknown photographer, Yi Sui Su. Only one other set of these prints is known, that being held at ANU in Australia. This image depicts the signing of the Boxer Protocol at the Spanish legation on the 7th of September, 1901, when the invading foreign armies extracted a prize from China after the defeat of the Boxer Uprising, a daunting 450, 450 million tails of silver or about 8.8 .8 billion pounds sterling in today's money. Robert Hart, whose job it was to raise that money for China to pay the foreign, the foreign powers, predicted that nothing but bad would come, nothing but bad would come from the settlement. And indeed, he was right. China's difficulties in paying the indemnity contributed to a great deal of instability. You may notice something odd about this image. It is composite. Uh, strips stitched together from two separate photographs, creating a sense of the uncanny sort of ontological instability, which Nicholas Royal describes as uncertainty regarding the reality of what is being experienced. The urge to stitch together the two parts of the image, the foreign and the Chinese sides of the story, to come up with a unified whole is an understandable urge, but it may not be achievable. A multiplicious approach in which plural perspectives are accepted may be a much more stable path. The objects associated with the Chinese Maritime Customs Service and held in Northern Ireland tell us an important story of foreign coercion in China, a history of which too many in the West are unaware, but which is prominent in Chinese understandings of their past. But these materials do not readily tell the wider story of China. In making sense of these objects, it's not just the imperial perspective which needs to be surfaced, as we've heard in many papers during this conference, in order to put these objects into their proper context. We also need to surface that understanding of Chinese culture and history, which is why I'd like to end with this image of Robert Hart leaving China for the last time in 1908, surrounded by an honor guard of his foreign staff and with Chinese faces in the background. So we are required and given a, ch a challenge, not only to document imperial history, but to place imperial history in its context, not allowing that history to efface the rich pasts of the countries subjected to imperial pressure.
thank you.